My name is Peter O'Connor. Uh, I'm a professor of information systems here at ESSEC, uh, also dean of academic programs. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time today talking to you a little bit about, about well, this theme here, about two different things, about social media and about business. I'm just going to close the door there because I know there's going to be a lot of noise from the video, so I'll close this one, I'll leave that one open. And the title I put up here, Social Media and Business, I put up for a very particular reason. There's two sets of words, social media and business. And one of the challenges we have is that getting the two of them to go together is really, really difficult. Social media is something we all use. Business is something we're all involved in. Putting the two of these things together is really, really difficult. Anyway, let me start with something a little bit more simple. We live in a wired society. Every aspect of our lives is being affected by technology. So as I'm speaking right now, your name is? Hugo. Hugo. Hugo is tweeting while I'm speaking. Are you putting the right hashtag? Really not. Okay, so every aspect of our lives has been affected by technology. It's crazy. And usually when I start these presentations, I like to start with a very short video. Science fiction? Am I crazy? Is that too far into the future? 
Here, let's have a show of hands because you're all very, very quiet, okay? Um, all of the technologies in this video, who thinks all of these technologies will be available in a mainstream consumer device um, in 2014? Who thinks they'll all be there in 2014? Two of you. Okay, 2015, couple of you. 2016, 2020, guys, you're in the wrong presentation. All of those technologies already exist and are already in mainstream consumer devices. This is not the future, this is history. This is history. And you know what? There's a fundamental shift going on as a result in the way we work, in the way we play, in the way we interact, and of course in business. And if you're in business these days, of course, you have to be on the web. It's given. It's absolutely a given. But there's a problem. If you actually look at statistics, we have a problem. One of the problems is the younger generation I'll pick you, I don't know, I don't think you're in the right, right generation, but the younger generation. The younger generation are not using the web as much as we do. They're not using email. In fact, we've seen a drop in email use because more and more and more they're going towards text messaging, mobile devices, whatever it happens to be. So that's why, in addition to being on the web, you have to have an app, and actually, you have to have an iPhone app. For those of you who are not using iPhones, I'm sorry, get with the program, okay? Android, <coughs> hmm. really, you have to have an app. But we have to go even further. And one of the challenges we have is that technology is moving really, really, really quickly. It's changing rapidly, which makes us feel uncomfortable. Today's consumer is very different from the consumer of just a couple of years ago. We have to interact with them in a very different way. Now this is a complicated graph. I'm going to explain it to you. The red lines, or the red um, uh, columns, are the increase in the use of the web among people in the US. So use of the web is still increasing, but it's increasing at a decreasing rate. The blue columns are increase in the use of Facebook. So Facebook has been growing and continues to grow and is growing at an increasing rate. And in fact, for many people, the web has become Facebook or other social media sites as we'll see. Another statistic, if you took all of the time that people in the UK spend online and you expressed it as one hour, about a quarter of their time is spent on social media. A quarter. Look down here, we have uh, shopping. Five minutes, one twelfth of their time. Over here we have adult. Two minutes, because that's all it takes. Um, we're going towards a place where social media has become the norm. We hear all these terms all of the time. And, it's quickly outpaced other medias in terms of reach. Think of the Arab Spring. Think of what's happened in the Arab world, a revolution which has been coordinated over social media. Think of the riots in the UK two summers ago, a revolution which has been coordinated over social media. It's a force for good, it's a force for bad, but it's definitely a force. But now we need to go back to a more fundamental question. What is social media? Because we use this term all of the time. Social media. What's social media? It's a media where we socialize. It's a, okay, what's a fish? It's a fish. <laughs> okay, it's a media where we socialize. Any other uh, attempts here? Uh, interacting on the web. Interacting on the web. Hmm, who, who's interacting? More interesting. People. People. Oh, people. Oh, hang on, are you sure? Because people is more interesting than companies. Because people is social. You know, if you ask the tech guys, the tech guys will give you back loads and loads of, of terminology. Web 2.0, Ajax, RSS. They'll give you all these buzz terms. But you know what? For me, social media is very simple. It's all about. 
people. It's all about people creating content for other people on the web. People creating content for other people. Now I chose every word there with care. Because you know what's not in that sentence? Businesses, selling, commerce. It's people creating content for other people. And as a business, it becomes very difficult to get into this relationship. Imagine you're at a bar. You're having fun. I'm Irish, so we spend a lot of time in bars. You're having fun with your friends. You're talking great crack. Crack is what we call fun in Ireland, OK, right? So absolutely great crack. And then this, this weird uh, Chinese guy comes along and tries to start selling you a used car. What's your reaction going to be? Not a good one. It's exactly the same thing on social media. You're having fun with your friends. You're interacting with people you know. And all of a sudden, here comes some weird company trying to sell you something that you don't actually want. It's not that it can't be done. It just needs to be done in a very different way. You see, these days we have Generation C. You've heard of Generation X, Generation Y, Generation uh, anything, but Generation C. Generation C, a couple of characteristics of these people. They're very, very creative. They're highly connected. They believe in community, and they believe in conversation. They're only motivated by one thing, which is cash. And the thing that links them together is content. I'm going to keep coming back to this word content again and again and again. Content. People creating content for other people. Because the web is all about content. Sometimes we use content. Sometimes we create content. And there's probably nobody in the room who hasn't created content. You've posted videos online. You've posted photos online. You've written comments. You've done so many different things. In fact, they estimate that within the next three years, 70% of all the content on the web will be created by users for other users. Which is a fundamental shift, because right now it's created by publishers, it's created by businesses, and its credibility is a big, big issue. Users creating content for other users. Now this content, some of it's good, some of it's bad. Some of it's just plain weird. Now, if you've just looked at this and gone, what was that all about? You don't get it. You're too old. You don't understand. I'll share something with you. We're all used to online video these days. We're used to YouTube. We watch a lot of YouTube. The day YouTube went live, before YouTube, there were 8,732 different versions of that video available online. 8,732 different people or groups of people found a video camera, videotaped themselves, lip syncing along to Numa Numa. Why? Why did they do that? But why bother? To have fun. To ha no, rem your name is? Fatim. Fatim. Remember, later, Fatim said to have fun. OK, just remember that. Right. Huh. 
One of the key characteristics, by the way, of social media is authenticity. It needs to be authentic. It needs to be very, very real. It can't be a uh, corporate message. You need to have something that really resonates with your consumers. The challenge is the consumers are not listening anymore. When we present them with marketing messages, increasingly they're going, hmm, I'm more and more skeptical. challenge. Increasingly consumers are saying, talk to the hand. They're saying, I don't want to he have this advertising from you. It's too intrusive. So we need to find a new way to interact with these consumers. And one of the buzzwords that you hear at the moment is this concept of inbound marketing. Instead of broadcasting your message to the world and annoying people, what you need to do is you need to get people to come to you. You need to suck them in. And social media is a great way of doing that. To do that, you have to figure out who influences your customers. Let me give you an example. I travel a lot. I travel about 150, 160 nights a year. My ass is airplane shaped. Okay? So, some, a blog that I love, a blog that I visit at least once a week, is this one. It's called onebag.com. OneBag.com is a blog for people who travel frequently and want to travel with just hand luggage. So they're not standing at Rossi Charles de Gaulle wondering if Air France has bothered to bring their bags back or not. For me, this is highly stimulating. This gives me value. For you, you're going, why on earth would anybody ever read that? You have to figure out what pushes people's buttons what works for them. And then if you can find the evangelist, if you can find the person who influences them, if you can find the person who has credibility for them, and you can get that person to talk about you, it's very, very powerful. That's one way. That's individual. We're social animals, okay? We like to hang out in different places. What you've got to do to use social media effectively is you've got to figure out where your customers hang out. Where do the people that you want to influence interact. I'll give you an example. Here's a US website called Rate My Professor. Rate My Professor is a social media website for students who go in and rate professors. And if you want to have people come to your class, you have to make sure that your score here is good. You have to manage it. Facebook. 
Who here is not on Facebook? There's always one. Come on, put up your hand. Who's not on Facebook? You see, look, there's always one. Okay, Facebook. Facebook's the big social media website, uh, network, but it's not the only one. There's lots and lots and lots of different ones out there, professional, um, uh, personal, highly specialized, and so on. And social network use is growing and growing and growing. Even I'm on Facebook, oh my god. Hmm. Let's talk about a couple of different ones. This is one, uh, this is a closed network called a small world. Is there anybody here on a small world? No, Small World is an invitation-only network, and um, basically it's full of young, urban, typically expat professionals. So it's a very, very particular audience, and if you're trying to sell to that audience, it can be a very useful place to be. Another one, um, uh, this one here is called Hot Enough. Hot Enough? Hot Enough is a website where you have to apply to become a member. And what you do is you have to send them three photos of yourself, and they send these three photos out to their members who get to vote on whether you're hot enough to join or not. <laughs> I've applied three times and been rejected each time. <laughs> Weird communities, uh, this is Red Karaoke. This is a uh, social network for people who like to sing and listen to karaoke. Now we're getting more and more and more specific, but if you're in the karaoke business, this is the place you need to be. And it gets even weirder, and I'm not lying to you about this, this is real, Dogster. Dogster is a social network for dogs. Now you're thinking, what the hell? I work with a major international hotel company, one of the top five, and we use Dogster for marketing. We contact the dogs. We contact, dear, what's this guy's name? Tonka. Dear Tonka, how would you like to bring your master on a special weekend break to Barcelona? We have a special room for you, and they have rooms for the dogs, yes, with TVs, not joking, okay, and now. If you are crazy enough to sign up your dog on a social network, you react very well to this. But that's the whole thing. It's niche markets, highly specialized niche markets that you have to treat very, very individually. Social media landscape, it's very, very complicated. And you know what? There are so many different systems and types of systems and new systems and mergers of systems. And on top of that, there's so many different pieces that fit together in so many different ways. And you know, you do something innocent, like you're out with your friends, you take a photograph of yourself, um, uh, what could you be doing that's naughty? You take a photograph of yourself uh, jumping off a bridge into the Seine. And it, you know, you just take this photo, you post it on Facebook, as soon as you post it on Facebook, your friends see it, your friends take it, they tweet it, it goes on blogs, there it goes again, Essex student drunk again, right? Off it goes, and it goes viral. If this is something good about you, it's great. If this is something bad about you, it's a big, big problem. And I work with a lot of different companies and they say, can we control this? The answer is no. You can't control this. Can you manage it? Yes. It's a very, very different thing. I'm going to share a very, very simple idea with you, okay? Very simple, looks complicated, but it's very simple. Here we have two axes. Effort across the bottom, effectiveness across the side. Upside down triangle, so there's a hierarchy of different things you can do, starting at the bottom. And we'll go through each one in a second, but you can start by just monitoring. Not very much effort, not very effective. Next thing, you create a passive presence on the social networks where your customers are. Bit more effort, a bit more effective. You start to interact with them by responding and then by participating, and if you can get to the ultimate level, you um, generate engagement, and that's really, really effective. And there, there's a whole series of techniques that you can actually use to do that. There's a perception that using social media for marketing is cheap, quick. I've left out one. Cheap, quick, easy. There's the third one. I knew there was three of them. It's not cheap. It's not quick. It's not easy. 
Because if you want to get up there where it's really, really effective, you have to invest a lot of time, a lot of money, and have a lot of expertise to make it work. Let's start at the bottom. Let's start at monitoring. You need to be aware of what people are saying about your brand. You need to see what's being said. I'll give you an example. Any of you remember these kryptonite uh, locks? No? Don't think they ever came to France. They were very, very popular in the Anglo-Saxon world. Kryptonite, it's a bicycle lock. They brought out this lock and they gave a guarantee. They said, we're so sure that our lock works that if anybody steals your bike, we'll replace your bike for free. And for a long time they worked. Until somebody discovered that if you took one of these pens and you jammed it into the lock, and you turned it, it formed a perfect key and it opened the lock. And they blogged about it. And Kryptonite lost millions because there were hundreds of thousands of bikes stolen. Give me another example. Uh, this one. I've hidden the, the, name of the, hotel, uh, the name of the hotel. It's a hotel. I was doing some work for a hotel company in the Middle East and we had a look at their Facebook presence. And we found this Facebook page coming up number one. Now let me give you a close up of a couple of the pictures. It's rather strange. So we investigated a little bit. And this was the Facebook page set up by the prostitutes who worked in the hotel to advertise their services. It even had online payment, and I'm not joking. And the hotel knew nothing about it because they weren't monitoring what was being said about them. How do you do it? You can take the civilian approach. Now, we're in the army now, but we'll talk about the civilian approach. You can set up a Google Alert. Okay, I'll give you an example. My name, Peter O'Connor. I've set up a Google Alert for Peter O'Connor. So whenever Peter O'Connor is mentioned on the web, whenever somebody tweets about Peter O'Connor, whenever somebody talks in a blog about me, mentions me in an open Facebook page, I get an email. Really bad idea. Really bad. Why? There's many, I'm unique, I'm sorry, oh, no, I'm unique. Okay, there are many Peter O'Connors, that's one reason. I'll give you another reason. Okay, most of you in the, in, the, uh, in the group here are old enough to remember. Do you remember there was a guy called Peter Gabriel? He looked like that. And there's a lady called Sinead O'Connor. She looks like that. And a couple of years ago, they recorded a, sing, a, sing, a song together. And this song is really popular with 14 to 15 year old girls who have just got dumped by their boyfriend. Now in the old days, 14 to 15 year old girls who just got dumped by their boyfriend, what did they do? They called their girlfriends and they cried. These days, what do 14 year and 15 year old girls who have dumped by their boyfriends do? They blog about it. They get on the web about it. They put it on Facebook. They make videos about it. And I get an email. <laughs> you have to be really careful how you use these tools. But anyway, a business is not going to do that. A business needs some sort of a social media monitoring tool. And these social media monitoring tools, they collect all the information about your brands. They process it. They use what's called sentiment analysis, which can tell whether people are saying nice things about you or bad things about you. And they can let you know when something bad happens. And that's really important. Let me show you an example here. You all know what Twitter is. Um, some people say Twitter is rubbish. But of course, we've heard it all before. Any new technology is subject to criticism. The telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is of no value to us. Huh, they got that kind of wrong. And it's the same thing with Twitter. You need to be aware of what's being said about you on Twitter. And if somebody's having a tantrum, you can't ignore it. I'll give you an example. You heard of this brand here called Cotton On? Cotton On's a brand, it's out of Australia, it's, it's quite prevalent in Singapore, Hong Kong. It makes cotton products like t-shirts, like underwear, like baby clothes. And they're quite famous for the provocative slogans that they put on their products. So for example here, I'm living proof my mom is easy. Okay. This one up here is the one that got them in trouble. They shake me. They shake me. 
me give you a piece of advice. Don't mess with young mothers. Don't mess with young mothers. Young mothers are highly protective and often they have some time on their hands. Don't mess with young mothers. Anyway, let me tell you a story. Anyway, young mother sees this t-shirt and she writes to Cotton On. She says, Cotton On, this is not funny. Child abuse is not funny. And Cotton On, um, they send her what we in Ireland call a PFO. Okay? PFO, please, off. Okay, basically, the contents of your email have been noted, but uh, you little person, we're not going to pay any attention to you. Don't mess with young mothers. Really bad idea. Young mother goes on a blog site for young mothers, and she starts to talk about this. Cotton on, are you on crack? Don't mess with young mothers. Now you don't just have one young mother who's pissed off, you've got lots of young mothers who are pissed off. They mount a Twitter campaign and they start talking about Cotton On. But when you go on Cotton On's web, uh, Twitter page, there's no mention of all these tweets. Because what are they doing? They're cleaning up their tweet feed. Hmm. So not only are they ignoring it, now they're provoking it. So it gets bigger and it starts getting picked up by blog sites and bigger blog sites. It gets picked up by the mainstream press and gradually over time it grows and it grows and it grows until eventually Cotton On has got to take, withdraw the t-shirts. They've got to apologize and they had to give a lot of money to a children's charity in order to make this problem go away. What started off as one complaint cost them a lot of money, and it shows that it used to be that the big fish could bully the little fish, but now all of the little fish can get together through social media and can really cause problems for the big fish. Now let me show you an alternative. Did anybody here eat pizza at lunchtime? Nobody had pizza? Good. He just spat on the sandwich. And it goes on and on and on. I won't disgust you any further, but it gets worse and worse and worse. So these people took a video camera and they videotaped themselves messing around and abusing other people's food at work. What was it you said earlier? Just for fun. Yeah. <laughs> Just for fun. Now the big difference here, of course, is Domino's Pizza were watching. They had a social media monitoring tool in place and they found this video and they found a video where lots and lots and lots of people were watching it. It was being shared. And they looked at it and they went ah! and within 12 hours, they, they couldn't stop it, but within 12 hours they had a video from the CEO of Domino's Pizza saying these people are crazy, they're fired, this doesn't normally happen in our stores and we're going to make sure they're prosecuted. They couldn't stop it, but at least they could control it. Because like it or not, these days, whenever you do something, people are looking at you, they're talking about you, they're tweeting at you, they're videotaping you, like him at the back earlier. Okay, so you gotta be really, no, not, not the professional, the guy with the iPhone, he thinks I didn't see him. Right, all of the time, there's a danger. So you need to understand what's out there about you. Everything we do is immediately visible on the web. It needs to be carefully monitored and carefully managed. I'll give you an example. I like disgusting examples, so this is a really disgusting example. This is actually a hotel in the Middle East. It's in Sharm el Sheikh in, uh, in Egypt. And uh, we were doing uh, some search engine um, marketing for them. And you know the way 
when you, in Google, until comparatively recently, about the third or fourth line down you used to get photographs. So if you search for Peter O'Connor, you got a couple of articles, and then you got photos. So we searched for the name of the hotel, we got a couple of articles, and then we got photos of the hotel. And the first photo, these photos come from Flickr, was a photo like this, which was a photo of a crisp, uh, a big uh, double bed, crisp Egyptian cotton sheets. And I'm sorry to be crude about this, there's no polite way to say this, but right in the middle of the bed was a big, stinking pile of poo. Now we have no idea if it was human, animal, no idea. We have no idea why somebody took a photograph of this. We have no idea if it was even the hotel. But when you search for the hotel, this is what you found. This is a problem. And the fact that it had been up there for months was a problem. Now you have two choices here. What can you do? You can try to clean it up. You can go to Flickr and say, hey Flickr, this is disgusting, take it down. But unless it involves like a crime or child porn or something like that, they're not going to take it down. So what you have to do is you have to try and sweep it under the rug. So here's what we did. We took lots of photos like this one. We took lots of photos of beautiful boys and girls on the beach, in the room, in the bar, and we tagged them with exactly the same words. And we put them up on Flickr, and then when somebody searched, the order is determined by how popular the photos are. Which photo would you prefer to look at? This one or the, think carefully, the big the stinking, the, the, the what? The man one. The man one, but not the poo. No, not the poo, okay, so, right, so it really, you, you have to think about the techniques to manage it. If we go to the next stage, passive presence, you set yourself up on the different social networks and you create your own presence. And here sometimes you have to do some crisis management, you have to try and make sure that your presence is good because people tend to complain, we'll talk about it in a second. What do you do with the presence? You need to talk to people. And unfortunately, at the beginning, often, ooh, it's uh, snow. Often at the beginning, well, people tend to complain. Because it's not user-generated content, it's user-generated discontent. Before you build up a relationship with people, they tend to complain. Now, we're not great at handling complaints. Really, even on the web. Let me give you an example of how not to do it. You all know who this guy is? fellow Irishman for me, his name is Michael O'Leary, he runs a little company called Ryanair. Now what is Ryanair famous for? Cheap. Cheap! Well no, actually I think Ryanair is famous for abusing its customers. Well, here, let me tell you a story about Ryanair. It was a, a customer one day, he went into the Ryanair website and he found that if you did this, this, this and this, you could book flights for free. No cost, no booking fee, no credit card fee, no luggage fee, no check-in fee, no toilet fee, zero, zero point zero zero. So he sent an email to Ryanair and said, hey Ryanair, you might want to watch out. If you go into your website and you do this, this, this and this, and the wind is blowing in the right direction, you can book flights for free. Now, what would the response of a normal company be to this? They would say, thank you, yeah. Here's Ryanair's response. Jason, you're an idiot and a liar. Fact is, blah, 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 blah. So, of course, he posted this online. And there was lots and lots and lots and lots of reactions. And it went back and forth and back and forth until our, at the end, Ryanair, they posted an official company statement saying, Ryanair can confirm that a Ryanair staff member did engage in a blog discussion. It is Ryanair policy not to waste time and energy corresponding with idiot bloggers. And Ryanair can confirm it won't be happening again. They posted this on a blog site for bloggers. <sighs> And this was all done by Ryanair staff member number one. Who is Ryanair staff member number one? The CEO? No. The PR team? No. The marketing team? No. Ryanair staff member number one was a 17-year-old stagiaire in the uh, marketing department of Ryanair who decided to make herself the official voice of Ryanair. 
So if you're going to use social media, you need to have firm, clear rules in place as to what people can do and what people can say. And if you're searching for these, what I would recommend you do is you search for this. You Google this. This is the blog assessment and response tool of the United States Air Force. The US Air Force has a blog assessment and response tool. And you know what? It's bloody good. I'll give you an example here, look. They break people who complain down into four categories. Trolls. A troll is somebody who is never happy. Come on, we all know somebody like this. A troll, one of your friends wins the lotto. They win four million. The first response is, oh, it was six million last week. You can't win with a troll. So there's no point in arguing with a troll. Number two, ragers. I'm a rager. A rager is somebody who gets really mad for a short period of time. So if you piss me off, I will shout and scream and kick and bite for about five minutes. After that, I'll be really sorry. But if you interrupt me in that five minutes, I will go nuclear. So there's no point in trying to argue with a rager either. Okay, what else do they have? Misguided, you need to correct them. Unhappy customer, you need to do some service recovery. Like I said, it's very, very good this. The only challenge I have with it is, how can you be an unhappy customer of the United States Air Force? Um, dear sir, you bombed at the wrong village. No, I, I, I don't know, there's something wrong there, but anyway, it's really, really, really good. The key thing here, of course, is listening. You need to listen to consumers and not just try to sell to them. You then get to the next stage, which is participation. And here what you're really trying to do is you're trying to leverage the network effect. You're trying to reach out not just to your friends, but to the friends of your friends and the friends of your friends. Let me show you an example of a company that did it really, really well. So you see, IKEA have been really smart. Very, very simple idea, just getting people to tag different items, which means it appears in your, in your Facebook feed, which means it appears in your friend's Facebook feed, and if they like it, and if they start talking about it, it appears again and again and again. And you know what? There's an entire science behind this. Um, I'll give you an example. Your name is? Olga. Olga. So, Olga, I go on your wall, and I post a photograph of myself, and underneath it I write, Peter O'Connor is the sexiest man in the world. What, what's going to happen? I try to delete you. You try? Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> but but uh, I'm sorry, but it's too late. It's already out there. The web has, has a, a, an incredible memory. What's going to happen? Not much. How about this? I go on Olga's wall. I post a photograph of myself. Underneath it I write, Peter O'Connor is the sexiest man in the world. Don't you agree? Question mark. Four extra words. What's going to happen? P 
people are going to say yes or no. As soon as they say yes or no, it spreads. And as it spreads, it goes from your wall to your friend's walls, to your friend's friend's walls, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I'll give you a very concrete example. This day, last week, we had La Nuit à Sec. Big party here in the school, 5,200 people. And I had to be here. I took a photo at about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I posted it on Facebook, and I said, at what stage are you too old to go to La Nuit à Sec? I had about 250 comments and about 700 likes. I've had about 50 people who've made friend requests with me as a result of that photo. 50. You gotta figure out how to spread your message using this network. And if you can do that, then you can get to the final stage, which is engagement. And engagement means you get other people to say interesting things about you. I'm going to show you two very short videos, very similar, but very, very different, both from the airline sector. Hopefully, if I can find my mouse. So, the first one. That's not social media. That's just good PR. They've taken a highly emotive occasion. They've taken very powerful images, special situation. They've made a video about it, and they're promoting themselves using that video. In terms of managing their digital reputation, it's quite interesting. Before that video, if you search for Spanair on YouTube, what did you find? What's the worst thing you can find about an airline? Crash. Plane crash. Video of a plane crash. So it's one way of starting to sweep that plane crash under the carpet. But where it becomes really interesting social media is how does Peter O'Connor, who has never flown with Spanair, who doesn't live in a city that Spanair actually services, even know of the existence of that video? That video was made on the 24th of December. Around the 27th of December, I kept seeing on Facebook, Spanair, Spanair. That's my Spanish accent, by the way. I don't speak Spanish. Spanair. So eventually, two or three days later, I say, hey, guys, for the benefit of us who don't speak Spanish, what are you talking about? Ah, Peter, you got to go and look at this video. Spanair is such a great company. Look what they did for their customers. Spanair is so good. Oh, they're so special. It's engagement. They have got their customers to talk really, really well about them. It's difficult to do. Let me show you another example. 
another two minute video, hopefully. Happiness, is it contagious? Can it really be spread? Can it really make a difference to a person's day? Like really? Could small doses of happiness be delivered like a message in a social media bottle to unsuspecting travelers at one of the world's busiest airports? and make a likable airline even more likable? We were curious to find out. Welcome to KLM Surprise. Armed with our social media toolkit, our little experiment began. First job, find KLM passengers who were checked into their flight via one of KLM's four square locations or left a message through Twitter. Second job, search their social profiles. Get to know them as well as you can to think of a personalized gift. Dat zijn heel sportief iemand is en een dikke droom gaan doen. Kijk is het misschien leuk als we haar zo'n Nike Plus bandje geven. Nothing fancy, like a house or a sports car. Just small stuff. Carry on size stuff. Third job, hunt them down and deliver the gift. 100% zei je dat er is. Dat is net een Goedemiddag. En je liet uh, ons weten via Twitter ja. dat je met ons reist vandaag. Ja. Dus we hebben een kleinigheidje voor je gekocht. Ja, wel leuk. Hartelijk ja, bedankt. Hoi. 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 Dan Kim, je hebt uh, laten weten dat je met ons vliegt vandaag naar Londen. Ja, dat klopt. Dus we willen je verrassen met iets, uh, nou, een, kleine, een kleine aardigheid. Dus we hebben een goedbon uh, voor je van 15 euro. After several weeks of handing out little gifts, a few things became apparent. In the age of social media, doing something that creates a real smile on somebody's face is much cooler than attaching a smiling face. But most importantly, it seemed that indeed an airline could use social media to both surprise and make a small difference to a passenger's day. And we're not just guessing, we know, because they told us, and their friends, massively. Look at these stats. Do you believe them? See, today's consumer is very, very skeptical, just like my friend here. And no, I don't believe them. This is advertising. They're telling us how good... Peter O'Connor is the sexiest man in the world. Peter O'Connor is the sexiest man in the world. It doesn't matter how many times I say it, it's not going to make it true. But the great thing about the web is you can check because everything is measurable on the web. Because right next to every video on YouTube, you have comments. Yes, let's look at the comments. Top comments. Wouldn't it be nice if KLM returned my new golf clubs, which they lost? A social media campaign does not work if you're not authentic in your core values in business. Based on the comments, it's clear that KLM has treated social media as a campaign, not as a channel for improving its relationships and being will willing to fundamentally change the way they do business. Of course, some people like it. If an airline did this for me, I'd fly with them for life. But my favorite comment is this one. But it's actually kind of creepy. And it actually highlights some of the, some of the, the kind of uh, cultural differences. One of the other initiatives that KLM has brought in since then using social media is called social seating. Uh, your, your name again was? Fatim. Fatim. So watch Fatim's face as I explain this. So on KLM's flights, you can now, when you check in, pick who you sit next to based on their Facebook profile and their LinkedIn profile. Now the reaction of most French people is like, Ugh! 
You talk to Dutch people and they go, hmm, that's really interesting, yeah, hmm, I'd like that. Very, very, very different attitudes. This whole area of social media, there's a lot of danger out there if you don't manage it. You need to be aware. You need to leverage it, which means you need to participate, you need to respond, and then you need to try and get engagement. Has to be very, very, very closely managed. Question I get asked all the time, where's the return on investment? Because if we're going to spend money on this, we need to make sure we're getting a return. It's very difficult to demonstrate the effect of spending money on social media. What I can tell you is, it's really easy to demonstrate the effect of not spending money on social media. It's become what we've called a hygiene factor. It's something that you have to do. Otherwise, your reputation just goes down and down and down. Managing your online presence, it's not easy, it's not cheap, but these days it's not optional. So my last piece of advice for you is this. Whether it's as a business, whether it's your personal reputation online, don't think about it, don't talk about it. The key thing you have to do is you have to just do it. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm not going to do an advertising thing to you. I was asked to put up two or three testimonials. These are all former students of mine, by the way. I didn't even know this until they, they gave me the slides. Doesn't matter what program you're applying for at ESSEC. Digital, technology, electronic uh, commerce, social media. It's a key part of what we deliver. And we have an increasing number of people who are working in this domain. This lady here works for the OECD. The organization, uh, for the organization for Economic Co uh, Cooperation and Development. Not exactly somewhere where you would think that social media makes a big difference, but as she says, it's an essential part of her job. This lady here works for Piaget in the luxury sector, somewhere where e-commerce has been relatively slow to develop, but is taking off really, really well right now. Burg Telecom, guy from 2005. Again, really, really taking off. And last but not least, uh, Nisha from two years ago, I think. Yeah, two years ago, who works for um, Duty Free. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Duty Free Sales? Is it? Uh, no, DFS? DFS. Is Duty Free Sales? It's the company that runs the Duty Free shops worldwide. But basically, no matter what sector you go into, no matter what course you take at ESSEC, you're going to find digital being a big, big part of the experience. Thank you for being with me today. If you have questions afterwards, please feel free to come and talk to me. Otherwise, any of the teams will help you with the different programs. Thank you. Thank you.